Hi, I'm Phnom. Hi, I'm Mardis. And we're the hosts of Future Future, where two designers talk about the future of everything. We're in the business of turning science fiction into reality for a better future. And today, we're going to talk about design for manufacturing. So what is Design for Manufacturing, Mardis? You mean DFM, Phenom? Yes. Better known as DFM, Design for Manufacturing is actually after we go from conceptual design and we're heading into production, but we're not quite there yet. So we're taking the conceptual designs and turning them into something that the manufacturer can look at, communicate with, and then start to build upon that later becomes a finished product. So there are three kind of important points that we have to cover in DFM. One is value engineering, which is basically kind of aligning the needs of the products in terms of manufacturing. Because at the end of conceptual design, we know what it looks like, we know how it's being used, who uses it, but we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost, what kind of components precisely are gonna go in there, and how it's going to feel after it's manufactured. So value engineering is going to take care of that. And then next, you have maintaining design intent. That is the most important part from a designer's perspective. When you spend so much time and blood and sweat into designing such a beautiful beautiful, well thought out design, you want it to look and feel the same all the way through the entire process. And number three is sourcing. And what is sourcing? Sourcing is actually going out and finding the right manufacturer, finding the right partners, finding the right components, monitors, screens, uh, uh, devices that actually go into the final product. And this is super important to make sure all these different areas are aligned to produce a product in the end. Value engineering is really uh, about making the product manufacturable at a price where people can, can purchase it. It's also about creating margins for the manufacturer. Nobody wants to just give away products. We have to actually make a little bit of money in the process. So uh, the engineer will take our conceptual design and start to design it in a way that really thinks about the mold making process if it's injection molding. So value engineering can be of many qualities. You can have a very cheaply put together piece of electronics or you can have an extremely sophisticated, uh, precise and, and something that doesn't rattle in the hand type of product. And this all depends on the attention that you put into the details and uh, the teamwork that is around uh, the work that needs to be done. For instance, if you have a, a molded part that isn't molded really well, you'll see what we call witness lines or visible part lines, but not part breaks. And then it just makes the product look uh, unattractive or you can feel it in the hand. If you have a, a handheld device and it constantly has a, a edge on it that's sharp, not good, so we try to refine all those things. So as a designer, you can actually de define where exactly that witness line is, right? Uh, it can be in a shadow, it can be hidden, because you can't really get away without them, right? That is the nature of what molds do. Uh, but that communication between the designer and the engineer is going to determine how beautiful the product is going to be from all angles. And then cycle time. This is an important term. So this is uh, how long it takes for a part to go through a process. So if you're injection molding and it takes five seconds to go through a process, it's gonna cost one amount of time and energy. But if it takes 10 minutes to go through a process, then your costs are gonna go up drastically. So we talk about the cycle time and trying to keep things very efficient to keep costs down. Another thing that's important is loss rates. Every single part that comes out of a mold may or may not make it all the way through production because there may be some mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, some blemishes, and you want the loss rates uh, to be as low as possible. You know, a good number would be what, 5%? Yeah. Depending on what Great. part you're doing. So let's talk about design intent. Yes, that is what uh, designers are interested in, making sure that the design intent that they have delivered during the conceptual phase is kept all the way uh, to manufacturing. So for the designer's perspective, you have to communicate and you have to listen to what engineers have to say. And I would say that all the way to uh, design education. 
Too often, I hear students say, well, I was taught by Professor XYZ that it is not our job to figure things out. It is the job of an engineer. And that is complete BS. You have, it is your responsibility as a designer to think about things, to anticipate problems, to open the door to communicating and figuring things out with engineers so your design intent is intact at the end. It is your responsibility to understand the materials and the processes and the performance of each one, the positives and the negatives. You don't have to understand them to the level of, say, an engineer, but you need to have enough of an understanding where you can have a good, open conversation that is intelligent and effective and moves you forward in the process. And from the perspective of an engineer, I would say we have experienced three types of engineers in, mm. our, in our career. What we call the no engineers, the yes engineers, and the yes but engineers. So Martis, tell us about the no engineers. Well, the no engineers are those engineers when you propose an amazing idea or innovation, they say no, it can't be done. No, too expensive. And that's the end of the story. And we just don't want to work with those people because they're, they're not productive at all. And then you have the yes engineers. Yes engineers, we say yes to anything that you say to them, whether they have experience, connection, or capabilities. And the reason why they say that is because they are pressured by their bosses to get in the business, right? And that happens a lot with manufacturers. And so that's why building relationships and, and really having that transparency of capabilities with all the partners um, in, in the process is extremely important. Having more experience, uh, with you know knowing how to ask the question asking the right questions at the right moment is going to um, you know eliminate uh, the risk of running it into yes engineers let's talk about yes but engineers now this is the funny one because uh, they always they always say yes we can do it but there may be uh, different issues that we have to tackle or maybe we have a few options to consider and in our opinion, this is by far the best engineer because they say we well, can be done, but uh, let's have some options along the way. For us, we know through the manufacturing process, things will change and that's okay, but do I have good options? So now we have a lot of things on the table to continue our process going forward and more importantly, to continue the design intent as we originally thought about it. So the engineers that industrial designers work with the most closely are mechanical engineers. They figure out you know, the part design and how it's put together, how it's going to be manufactured, et cetera, et cetera. And the subset of mechanical engineers are design engineers. They do exactly the same job as mechanical engineers, plus they really understand design intent and why designers spend so much time on surface transitions and radii and and all that precision that comes with um, you know a very specific design language and they will respect that while solving all of their technical problems and this gets back to the whole idea of communication if you have great communication if you have an engineer that understands the basics of design and respects it as well as a designer who understands the basics of manufacturing and process then in turn we can have a great conversation and then phew, anything can happen if you're in front of an engineer who insists on rebuilding your surfaces, that's a big no-no, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where they are taught that. I don't know if it's being lazy, being incompetent, whatever, but designers actually spend a lot of time creating very complex surfaces that cannot, under any circumstance, be rebuilt by any engineer. Mm -hmm. The engineer has to take those surfaces and inject all of their um, details and technical parts into it. That is the only way you can, one, um, you know, keep design intent and two, make the product work in the end. So our final, final point under maintaining design intent is about documentation. So documentation is not only creating beautiful surfaces as Phnom just mentioned, but also about creating um, documents that call out colors, materials, finishes, and most importantly is creating prototypes. Physical prototypes are perfect because you can have all the color naming and schemes that you want, but if you don't show a physical prototype that tells the story of your final product, then something gets lost. And there's two different types of uh, prototyping. And one is a, a looks like uh, prototype, and then another one is acts like prototype. 
Uh, one is very much a cosmetic, beautiful prototype. Another one is actually a prototype like a speaker, for instance. We want to hear the sound, so it has to function properly. And when you mix those two, it's called a looks like, works like prototype. And not only does it look exactly like the final product you intend, but it sounds like it, functions like it, and it tells a great story that we can then give it to the manufacturer and say, this is your uh, guideline to following the proper production of this product. And the third point we would like to make in this video is about sourcing. So throughout the process of design for manufacturing, you have to source prototypers. You know, they are going to deliver all, the, all those uh, material chips, all those cosmetic materials or functional materials to, um, to make sure that we make the right decisions along the way. And then another type of sourcing is for the manufacturer. You need to find a manufacturer of the right components uh, at the quality that you want and the price that you want. You have to find manufacturers for the parts that are going to cover those components and make sure that your expectations of quality are the same that it can deliver. So another part of uh, sourcing is to make sure whatever components you use, they're not going to run out. For instance, we select um, a very common screen or battery or something. We know that's going to be around for a long time throughout millions of products without changing. But if we select a very customized or a very uh, lesser used product, then we may not have that through the entire production line of our product, causing all kinds of problems down the road. So it's very important to roadmap out your sourcing um, platform. And that's when asking the right questions to the manufacturer is extremely important because that manufacturer only cares about selling you uh, their last parts, right? If you only have 5,000 parts of a screen left, they will sell them to you but they will not tell you that they don't have 6,000 of them. So it is your responsibility to ask them the questions in advance. So the takeaway of this video is uh, from the perspective of a designer to know your uh, manufacturing processes. You have to understand um, the lingo that, that comes with, you know, I want this part to be made this way and books like this one, Manufacturing Processes for Design Professionals by Rob Thompson is a great place to start. I recommend this to all students and every uh, person who is interested in design for manufacturing. Next is communicate build relationships. It's not because you're a designer that you have to put yourself on the pedestal and think that everything that you say just needs to be uh, interpreted exactly the same way, right? If you don't communicate with engineers, if you don't solve problems together, if you don't build relationship with manufacturers and prototypers, your product is never going to end up the way you want it to be. And then finally, um, there's, a, there's a quote that uh, we are reminded of all the time that says, you know, decide what good means to you before, uh, you know, you, you change your mind when things get hard. Um, things are going to get hard. We talked about conceptual design, we talked about design for manufacturing, there are many steps that come after that. NPI, EVT, DVT, BVT production, etc. Uh, we can talk that in uh, future uh, episodes, but, but the process is going to be very hard. There's going to be a lot of hurdles, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to make decisions that go against what you want. It is your responsibility as a designer, as a um, partner of engineers and of manufacturing to push the right ideas all the way. So we know there's a wide range of studios going from conceptual design all the way to technical and into the engineering manufacturing process. We at Nonfiction live in the space of very technical. We, we do all the conceptual, we interact with the engineers, we collaborate with the partners and manufacturers to make sure products always go to market. This is where we're happiest and this is where we're most effective. And this is where we invite you to come with us on this journey. So thank you for joining us in DFM. Design for Manufacturing. It's been a pleasure, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.